wonderful parents, and I grew up in Hingham, Massachusetts, which is a seacoast town. So we had a, a lot, a big, huge barn, and lots of pets in the barn. It was just so much fun to go out and hear quacks and clucks and neighs and barks and meows. <laughs> I really wanted a horse, and they didn't know anything about horses, but we did have a barn with stall. So I just read every book in our Hingham library. They had a little horse on the, on the spine. <laughs> and so I would just read them like, it was, I was intense. And I finally found a newspaper ad, camp horses need homes for the winter. And so I put it on the refrigerator with scotch tape. And you know, my parents finally you know, went and found out about these horses. So we got a free horse every, every winter and I took care of it. One of the most influential things was my best friend, Marla. She loved horses too, and neither, the, when we first started drawing them, we wanted a horse, but we hadn't gotten one yet. And we would just draw, and she was a much better artist than I was. So there's something about having a, we'd just spend hours. We had a big counter with a, drawers that came out underneath with all broken crayons in them, hundreds of broken crayons. And we'd just draw, and my father worked for a computer company, and then he got the paper from the company. So we had just paper and, and crayons and we'd in, we invented these horses and then we'd go outside and play. We were, were the horses and we just lit this imaginary life. My best friend and also my sister, my, my sister too. We all drew all the time. And all books, of course. We had so many books. And uh, my favorite was Beatrix Potter. And she was the one who opened my eyes to what a book could do. Uh, and words that I might not know, like um, raisins in a pudding, that you could just kind of, oh, I think I know what that means, and, and save that word. I love that about her. And then you felt like on the roof you'd see these slates and you could just feel the sunshine on them. Or s the sm oh, smells, all these things that you can't put in a book. You could kind of, they kind of came from the, out from the pages. So to this day, that's when I know I finished a page when I feel like I can walk inside the picture and feel like I'm in that place, smelling the smells, feeling the wind, touching things, and it's all this magic that happens. And actually when you're doing the picture, the magic, sometimes doesn't appear until like maybe late at night you're working away put everything down to go to bed and then you wake up and you look and you say who did that it looks like there were elves here because something takes over and if there's one thing i could express to children it's that you have that inside you that will appear and sometimes you, you can't force it but it well you have, can let it appear your imagination and this kind of like knowledge of humanness that happens with the art. My parents had so many friends. Saturday morning cars would just drive in the driveway all the time unannounced and they would all, we'd be drawing and all the friends would always say, oh Jan, you're gonna be an illustrator someday. I mean, I never remember the, the moment I said, I'm gonna be an illustrator. People would say, you are going to be. I think I looked at my art and thought it was better than it really was. Because I remember taking it to different art galleries and they'd say, well, keep going along the same path that you'll make it. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm there. And they, well, no, I wasn't there yet. And, and the same when I was illustrating. I would go, it's a wonderful process. You take your portfolio to the different publishing houses and the art director will look at, look at it. And they're always were really nice. And, would, and if they gave me a book that meant like, oh yeah, please come back. It was kind of code for, yeah, we want to be involved with you. But um, I was at Houghton Mifflin, the editor there, Walter Lorraine, he said, um, you know, if we try to match you up with a writer, it may take a long time to get just the right story. Why don't you write your own story? And I said, I'm not a writer. I can't possibly. And he said, how about stories? Do you like to tell stories? And I said, oh yes, I like to tell stories. Well, just write those stories down. And he said, you know, there's only like five, ten different themes. Like you can't go home again. I'm funny looking, but then it turned out, out to be a good thing. And what it is, it's in the telling. And that kind of released something in me. I felt like, wow, that's okay to do. And so I did Fritz of the Beautiful Horses. It was my first book for him. 
And I had, when I did the dummy, which I don't know if you know, you do a, a, a mock book first. The mock book um, just helps you a roadmap about where the book is going, the arc of the plot. Is it exciting enough in certain places? Is there characters that will emerge as more important as you draw them? And then you can use that to inform the final drawings, which you spent a long time on. And he said, uh, I had borders, and he said, you know, Jim, we don't want any PLBs, pretty little books. And I said, well, then when I came back with Annie and the Wild Animals, the second book I did for Houghton Mifflin, I said, well, there'll be a story in the borders. And then he said, then it's okay, you can do the borders. Because when you first start out, you're very reliant on your editor to guide you. And you know, I still am, and you form a bond of trust with the editor, because they could kind of save you from yourself sometimes. So we, we both had the same goal. And so Walter gave me really good advice about, yes, I can write if I'm a storyteller. And also, um, it's literature, it, no, no pretty little books. Children have their own literature. And I think if I have any talent, it's I can remember back being six, seven, eight years old about what I thought about my books and loving to that age of discovery where everything is new. So I love that feeling and I try to, it comes back when I draw. So I think that's part of it. Going to a fine arts school was a very good step because I, my teachers were fantastic. They always, I learned things then that I didn't give much credit for, but as, as I've become, uh, this is my livelihood, they've meant more and more as years go by. And illustration was at the bottom of the barrel. But I did have some very good teachers that still they retain from, that were very old school. We did lithographs on stones and etchings, but we had great drawing teachers. And that was always considered, no matter how contemporary you were, how far away you went from it, that, that drawing was always considered uh, sacred. You know, you had to know how to draw and be able to get the flow going and um, have it be like a, a, a language. A language so that was that stayed intact. Joe Hearn and I met when I was flying upside down in a biplane at the Plymouth Airport and it was a glider port and I would work there and then get a free tow, you know, the tow plane tows the glider up so I could take lessons. So I worked there and my daughter was little, she used to come with me, and Joe was one of the instructors. So I met him and sometimes he would give me lessons. And now I had a ticket to the Boston Symphony on Friday afternoons with my mom. So when I found out that he was um, a musician there, um, hi, <laughs> I waved from the balcony and um, he invited me to a little performance of, I think it was the Incredible String Quartet with four basses. And so he, it, there was a performance um, across the street that he invited me to, and that was, that was what, how it began. You know, I remember my eighth grade teacher said, one to 10, and put uh, descriptive um, adjectives about what you would like to be as an adult. And I think uh, well, the first one was to be a nice person and a good mother, but then after that, I wanted to um, be continental. That's what I wrote. <laughs> Meaning, I could say, I know a great restaurant in Paris, or I've been to, you know, India, or something like that. I don't know where that came from. I guess from my books, because I loved the Jungle Book. I loved Beatrix Potter, England. Um, I love Ping, which is probably considered outdated now, but that was set in the Yangtze River with the boats that had eyes. I mean, I just thought, a place where boats have painted eyes, how cool is that? And just loved those worlds that my books took me to, and I wanted to see the real thing. It really exists. I remember the first, one of the first books I illustrated was St. Patrick's Day in the Morning by Eve Bunting. And this was before I was writing my own stories. And I went to the library, wonderful library in Hingham, and uh, lots of books on Ireland. And they, I said, it can't be like this. Green with little lambs and rainbows. And uh, so I, I borrowed money from my bank, $1,000. And my mom went and I went, and we went in, uh, around St. Patrick's Day. 
and it was exactly like the books. All green with little stone walls of lambs jumping up over them. And I loved it. And But there were also towns that were, you know, a little bit, um, weren't having the best of their era at that moment. And I put those in. I wanted it to be authentic because the writer was an Irish woman and I wanted to have it be true to her vision. And it was great. So then from then on, I said, that, I, that seals the deal. I'm gonna go to the places. But I've been to um, China, Japan, Russia, St. Petersburg, um, Costa Rica, a lot with the orchestra. So the orchestra will go someplace and I'll tag along and go to the concerts and then go sightseeing and discover things. <laughs> Well, growing up, we always went into the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. My mother actually was one on the ladies' committee, was called then. And so she was there all the time, and we would go in and had our favorite places. But whenever we traveled, we would go to museums, and now when I do a book, there's often a museum attached to it. Um, for example, in Russia, there's a cultural museum, and they have all these wonderful uh, native clothes or traditional clothes that are with the, uh, have beautiful uh, headdresses and every village is different. Um, in Denmark there was a museum that had a five colored hat and I actually have a hat that someone knit me for it um, that was like unearthed from peat so it was really old beautifully made but the peat um, preserved it and so I have that in the hat. We went to Denmark and we stayed in the house that you can see with the thatched roof. It was made into a, like a fancy hotel. And one of the things I remember learning in that museum was that in the olden days you would have whitewash. And then if you wanted it to be orange or rust colored, you'd put iron nails in the whitewash and it could be like peach colored or dark red according to how many nails you put, iron nails you put in it, which I thought was really cool. In Africa, we didn't have museums, but I was able to speak to a lot of the people that worked at the resorts that we were in. When I say resort, we're talking about tents. Uh, all the ladies would make baskets in their spare time, and they would, um, I asked them how, and that became part of the uh, borders and they showed me how to do it and what plants you would use to make a red or a black or, you know, the colors of it. I, I found that fascinating. And other museums in Nunavut, which is Baffin Island for the snow bears, there was um, a museum there that was a living museum in that there was a beautiful center built by the government and all the people that, indigenous people, would come there and gather, drink tea and be in a warm, beautiful place, and they would do weaving, rock carving, you know, those beautiful sculptures that you see that are so organic. Um, the Ukrainian Museum in the United States was fantastic. It's like in the lower, like 10th Street, maybe, in Manhattan. Wonderful curator there helped me. She said, make sure that the little boy's clothing would have been too big for him and tied with a belt to fit because you wouldn't have just gone to a big box store and bought something. It's time for you to, you've grown a little bit. It would be passed down from a the older brother, maybe even the father, because the clothes would have been handmade and loved. And for clothes for a festival might be passed down for generations. They would be worked in beautiful embroidery. And I, of course, I love that because I thought they were beautiful. So I, beauty is very much a part of uh, something that I feel like I can take in and if when I draw it, I'm part of it. So I love that part. I would say that I'm drawn to holidays because families are together and often, I, I can't tell you how many people have said, we take out your book at Christmas time and we put it on the coffee table because that's the way it was in our house that there would be special books that were Christmas books and they always involved magic or not magic in that there was a wand, but the, uh, the flow of imagination. And we were 
In our family, we're, we're allowed to be children for a long time. So I don't think I really ever felt that there was, that it was just a regular day. It always had some import that was kind of dedicated to family and to uh, one's imagination, to history. So I, I always loved that, and you know, the starry night, and would, we always thought we could definitely hear the reindeer on our roof. I love the fact that children are my audience because they, their thoughts go in places that you would not expect. They haven't been ramrodded of like, you have to think this. And I remember being like that when I was little, just scatter, anything would be interesting. And I will often open up a book and the child will be with their parents and they'll get their pointer finger out and they'll look all around and they'll say, now I had this kind of cat. The best story is Goldilocks, one of the first books that I ever did. And this little boy was looked in and I had a, a Jack in the Pulpit flower. This is a wildflower that is shaped like a little cone with a flap over it. It's very beautiful, it's brown and green. And we have them in our backyard in Norwell. And I have only have a mouse in mind. He's the, the Jack in the, in the pulpit. And he said, we have that wildflower. And his mother said, no, we don't have that wildflower. And, he, and I said, well, do you have like a marshy area in your backyard with, um, you know, just going back into woods and they said he said yes I said well you know he could very well have seen it in the early spring they will come out and they're about the size of a five or six year old boy which he was and um, so he's looking very like told you so and then then he gets this twinkle in his eye and he goes but we don't have a mouse in ours he totally understood the idea of like it looks like it's called a jack in the pulpit but it looks like something could go in there and so I put a mouse in there and he, he and that made me so happy because sometimes I'm not really thinking about all the children in the world. I'm just thinking about that one child that's going to see that. And I'd love to, if I could have one wish, it would be that I'm helping them learn how to see. I like to have them learn that that can be a happy experience to use your eyes. You know, there's all kinds of things that unfold if you look carefully.